a lot of it was about really trying to see, you know, can you have characters communicating every way except for dialogue. You know, the only animal, the only character in the film who speaks is the cow. He says moo. The rest of the time, the you know, Ian Mune and Martin Sanderson talk to each other by playing their guitars and. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it was just the desire to do something that was, uh, you know, very filmic and very visual. And I mean, I was really lucky that, you know, when you see the film, obviously it's set on um, on a wet set on a on a swimming pool inside a studio, and, and um, you know, the most insane kind of um, thing to try and attempt. But you know, luckily my producer, the wonderful Chloe Smith, um, was also the producer of Xena, so we were able to use some of Xena's um, kind of sets and resources at the at the end of the shooting of Xena. Um, without which it couldn't, be, couldn't have been achieved. The cow was um, another really difficult part of the equation, um, including you know, two, two actors, Martin Sanderson and Ian Mune, who had never played guitars in their lives, and they had to communicate by only playing guitar. So that was a challenge, but the cow was another challenge. Obviously, um, cows you know, don't naturally like standing on floaty things. Um, but it was, uh, the cow was found and trained by Mark Vetti, who's an amazing animal wrangler trainer, um, who's, who's you know, responsible for most of the animal work that you'll see on the screens, who also, his company trained uh, the dog in Matariki. Um, and so Mark has, he's this amazing Buddhist animal whisperer who can get animals to do the most extraordinary things. There's so many things about Cal that I'm proud of, but most of all I'm proud about, you know, Martin Sanderson, who's just one of our most wonderful actors and has passed away since Cal, and Ian Mune, who were dear old friends and they'd never actually worked in front of the camera together before. And I think that's the thing that I'm proudest about that movie, is that these two wonderful actors um, were in front of the lens for the first time on this slightly crazy movie. And, um, you know, and it was really beautiful that, you know, Martin and Ian had the chance to work together before Martin passed away. Yeah. Kerosene Creek is, is uh, you know, a much more kind of weighty film, um, you know, much more dramatic and in that sense that, you, you know, it is really about um, kind of profound human drama issues, you know, a little girl trying to deal with the death of her little mate. Um, and so I, I guess I set myself a few kind of tasks that I wanted to do with that film. Um, one was, yeah, to, to do something that was much more serious um, and non-surreal, much more kind of, you know, um, r in the real world. Um, but also, you know, working with kids, Atarangi and Darcy were both, I don't think, maybe 11 when we shot the film. Um, first time for both of them in front of the camera. Um, and, and that was a pretty amazing, uh, you know, experience working with, with new actors and um, in, in a, quite a challenging drama. And, but also with Kerosene Creek, um, you know, it's a split time frame kind of film. So it was, it's, it was still slightly unusual in terms of short films and it takes place in two different time frames um, with the two time frames ultimately coming together at the end of the film for the resolution of the movie. We had our premiere in Berlin for Kerosene Creek and that was pretty amazing because, you know, sitting, you always worry about how something's going to travel the, away from your own cultural context. You know, is the story universal enough? And, and sitting in the movie theatre on the other side of the world and sort of, you know, feeling a definite emotional reaction to what was happening on the screen in front of you and, and then, you know, in other screenings as well, I guess, back here in New Zealand. Um, yeah, I mean, you make a movie for an audience. You don't sort of, if you if you, your desires are just purely artistic then, uh, and, you know, purely to satisfy your own artistic urges, and I think it's better to buy a $10 canvas and sit at home and paint and, and hang that on your wall. Um, I mean, for me, what I want to do in filmmaking is to give the audience some kind of a journey, and that is the, always the most rewarding thing, is to sit with an audience and to feel that you've given them a journey. To me, it, it really is a film about transcendence, and you know that's. I think it comes back to the metaphor of matariki, which is, you know, it, it's such a beautiful metaphor in New Zealand that you know matariki is that time when the when this little cluster of stars rises, and it means so much. And what it does mean is that it's a time when you reassess, when you it's a time when you look at you say goodbye to those who've gone before that have passed away during the year. But you also look at your own life, you know, what do I need to do to go forward? What doors do I need to close behind me? How do I move forward? And to me, that's kind of such a beautiful metaphor of transcendence. And, and for me, every character in the film, in some kind of ways, in bigger or smaller ways, goes through some form of transcendence. They, they, 
as Matariki rises, they they find a way to move forward out of the darkness and to, you know, to, to keep going forward and to find a new way of going on. Um, and I guess that's, yeah, that to me is the overall kind of uh, journey that I wanted to give on a deeper level, you know, and that's in the undercurrent. And I think it's what you feel, it's not necessarily what you consciously are aware of because, you know, it's, but, but to me that's the sense that I wanted to give in the film, a sense of cautious hope and optimism that, you know, that no matter what situation you are in, no matter where you find yourself, you can keep going forward and you can, you can find a better place to aim for. Yeah. And that's been a fascinating part of the process for me because it really is an ensemble cast and an ensemble performance. You know, it's eight lead characters, eight lead actors, uh, each making, you know, I'm unbelievably proud of what those guys did. You know, I think it's a really beautiful ensemble of performances um, and um, that makes one performance in a way. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of journeys that, that sort of meld together to make one big journey. The tough thing for the actors, I think, coming out of that, though, is that as an ensemble cast, you know, all the notices, you know, all the great reviews that we're getting about the performances uh, talk about them as an ensemble. So, you know, it, it, I think it might be a little bit tough for the actors and, you know, normally as a lead you'd be talked about. We've got eight leads and they're talked about collectively, which is a, a real shame in a sense, but, but it's the way the story is. Um, you know, a, and to me, like, I guess, you know, the, the movie definitely does build to a moment of transcendence and when all the stories come together and, and the, I guess, the emotionally climactic scene towards the end of the film. And that, to me, you know, and I'm really, you know, sort of humbled that it does seem to have a power to it that audiences do seem to be really reacting to and, and moved by. One of the big moments was the very first day of um, shooting when we had the two youngest members of the cast, Jason Wu and Susanna Tang, who play um, Aliki the car thief and, and Spit the runaway uh, Chinese girl. Um, so the very first slate of the film was our two youngest cast members who had never been in front of a camera before. And that was pretty scary. You know, they'd been amazing in rehearsals. They're two very, very intelligent young actors. and. Um, but they'd never been in front of a camera before. They'd never been in front of 50, pe 50 crew members, 50 sets of eyes looking at them, waiting for them to do something. And you just don't know. And, and that was a pretty amazing moment was, you know, we set up for the first shot. Uh, it was a pretty big emotional scene for those two. Um, it was a big ask. Uh, we, went, we did the first take and they were fantastic. And, it was a very cool moment being able to buy that very first take, you know, not have, not go again, and to know that you know to be able to tell the kids that you know you've nailed it, fantastic. Moving on to the next setup, and uh, yeah, it felt like a really kind of you know, a, a really great moment, and 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 that sort of set the tone of the film. I think you know we kept on a roll after that. Yeah. I keep thinking this is just a really mad career that you, you, you're setting yourself up for endless, uh, you know, endless non-satisfaction because actually you, you you pull one thing off and but really what's driving you is the next one and the next one and that as a filmmaker is I think what you kind of doomed to do is to always be pushing on to the next one and to be and and recognizing that you know you might have learned a few things from this one but you don't know everything and the next one you're going to be learning a whole lot more and you're going to be able to you know practice your craft on again, but then it'll be the next one after that that keeps on driving you. So it's a, it's a bit of an endless, endless cycle, but it's a really beautiful cycle to be a part of.